Uh, in 1977, we discovered that human genes come in uh, segments, there are split genes, where sense sequences in the gene is interrupted by nonsense sequences. So there would be sense, nonsense, sense, nonsense along the DNA of our genes. And the, to make, to express the gene, the nonsense sequences have to be edited out, literally cut out, at the level of the RNA which is copied from the gene. And that process is called RNA splicing. Uh, it is uh, executed in the cell by a very complex machine called the spliceosome, which contains small nuclear RNAs and a number of proteins, literally a hundred, that removes these introns from the uh, gene. Now, the reason that's important to understand is that about a quarter of all human genetic mutations that cause disease are in, interrupt the splicing process. So if you didn't understand the structure of a gene and its intron-exon relationship, you couldn't understand how mutations interrupt the expression of a gene. But even more importantly, we find that most genes in uh, human cells, in different cell types, such as your skin cell or your blood cell, uh, are expressed, spliced in different patterns. Meaning that if you have 10 sense segments, maybe nine will be used in one cell type and another nine will be used in another. Which means that for every gene we have in, coded in our genome, and we have 23,000 genes, uh, you can literally make hundreds of thousands of different proteins because this alternative splicing process gives you then waves of taking the information in each gene and making different proteins from it. And this vastly complicates how we understand the activity of genes in different uh, cells. So uh, we can have potentially and do find uh, mutations that in one cell type, because that piece of information is not used, has no effect, but in another cell type where that piece of information is used by alternative splicing, you get a defect. So it's a uh, very complicated picture. Um, we sort of expected when we sequenced the human genome that we would have all the information uh, and read readily available to us to understand human physiology. But in essence, we got the sequence, but we didn't get the patterns in which this information is then copied from, from the genome by splicing. So now we're in the process of using uh, the vast power uh, of new sequencing technology where we can sequence the pattern of RNA from a whole variety of different cells, both normal and disease, and understand this alternative splicing process and how it's changing from one cell type to another. And uh, this uh, is something that's uh, very important in, in cancer, in understanding how cancer patterns are, are um, the, the mutations in cancer are shifting genes, so they cause the cells to become malignant and move through, through the body and become lethal. And it's also very important in, in uh, the, uh, the interpreting disease genes, such as uh, a, a gene that uh, causes a defect in the, the blood system, uh, hemophilia. Um, so uh, we can understand the, the specific nature of, of the mutations that, that are causing the disease process. And um, we're now beginning to, th to develop therapies that uh, depend on uh, nucleic acids, sort of, uh, 
drugs that pair with the RNA and shift the splicing of patterns. And uh, that's being uh, tested for muscular dystrophy, uh, where if we can activate one splicing pattern, we are pretty confident we can uh, ameliorate or, or suppress the uh, muscle, muscular defects in that disease and allow children to live to a, a ripe age, an appropriate age. So uh, it's, uh, it's the, the process of, of finding out how to uh, uh, deliver these specific n nucleic acids to cells that then to shift the splicing problem as a uh, uh, pattern is the, the major challenge right now. We discovered RNA splicing back in 1977 when we were uh, trying to understand uh, a paradox. Uh, the paradox was uh, human cells contain a, a vast amount of DNA uh, and we suspected that that DNA was not necessary to code for the number of genes that human cells needed to to carry on their, their activity. So we didn't understand wh wh what that DNA was about, how it was uh, being used. And that and another hint that there was something called long nuclear RNA led me and my colleagues at MIT to begin to study the relationship between uh, the structure of nuclear RNA and cytoplasmic RNA in uh, adenovirus infected cells. This is a virus that everybody has. It's a common infection, doesn't usually cause any disease, but it is uh, a, a really uh, easy model to uh, handle in a laboratory and study. And uh, why we were doing that, uh, we uh, observed in the electron microscope where we could compare patterns of RNA and DNA being paired together, that uh, one tail of the RNA uh, would not pair with the DNA from the virus that we were using, the local DNA. Uh, and we puzzled about that. It should have. <laughs> if everything we understood about a gene, this should have paired quite nicely. Uh, and it didn't. And then that led us to thinking about, well, why not? And where did these sequences at the five prime end of that uh, messenger RNA or RNA from the cytoplasm of the cell, where did they come from? And when we then started looking for them in other parts of the viral genome, uh, we uh, discovered that this tail was actually formed with three small pieces of RNA spliced together. And we coined the word splicing. We introduced the word splicing into your textbooks and into our vocabulary. And uh, we then you know, recognized that these three pieces were being made from other parts of the genome, being spliced together in a pattern and joined to the, the fourth piece, which was the large body of the, of the message. And that told us that the relationship between that long nuclear RNA and the smaller cytoplasmic RNA was this precursor splicing product where the intervening sequences or the intron sequences were being spliced out and the mature message was being made. So once we saw this in adenovirus infected cells and we knew that in uh, normal cells, there was this long nuclear RNA and smaller cytoplasmic RNA, we clearly understood that most human genes had this intron exon structure where multiple pieces of the sense gene were interrupted by introns and they were then spliced out to make the exons. And in all of the literature, in all of time before that discovery, no one had hypothesized that the structure of a gene was going to be split genes and exons and introns joined together. 
uh, it was just so outrageous, so outlandish, no one had thought about it. And, you know, it was just incredibly exciting, you know, un understanding what was going on, being able to create the language, being able to talk about it and publish was just so exciting. And the really interesting thing is within a few months of the time we made the discovery, every scientist literally on Earth knew about the discovery, knew about the structure of genes, and was beginning to work on it in, in many ways, in conceptually in most cases, a few cases experimentally. So it was a, just a whirlwind of discovery spreading across uh, the, the, the scientific community internationally. And uh, it was a, an incredibly exciting, exciting time. And then the, the, the question after we understood that these introns existed, um, we, we decided, I decided in the lab, that one of the subjects I wanted to study was what was the process by which the introns were removed. And uh, to do that, I had to get this biochemical reaction to happen in a test tube. So I could begin to purify components and, and delete components and test whether they were really required for the splicing process. And uh, it took us a couple of years of, of, you know, hard work to get this reaction to go in a, in a test tube. And we ultimately devised a very sensitive assay and detected it and then began to perfect it in, the, in our biochemistry. And then found out that the RNA that was spliced out as the intron RNA was spliced out by a very special structure called the lariat. Looking at the lariat structure and how the second step in splicing had to happen, we knew there had to be a large complex that carried out this splicing process. And we started searching for that complex and we found it as a, a body called a spliceosome, which we coined the term spliceosome. And uh, it was a splicing body and it's uh, a very complex uh, set of RNA and, and proteins. And that's exciting because the RNA that is part of the spliceosome, these little bits of RNA that are assembled to in the spliceosome, now appear to be uh, executing the uh, RNA cutting and joining, the actual chemistry of splicing. So this reaction uh, in the spliceosome appears to be a, a biochemically and evolutionarily very old reaction coming from RNA catalysis where RNA is carrying out the chemical cutting and joining. And we suspected it's a uh, remnant of what is known in, in your textbooks and in your in thinking of the RNA world. And that is the first biological systems on Earth uh, all billions of years ago uh, were likely to be RNA genetic systems where the genes were encoded in RNA, not in DNA. DNA is a late arrival in the biochemical sphere and that RNA was a genetic material, and RNA was carrying out catalytic functions, breaking and joining, and that RNA was then a, a major component of this pathway of taking information and decoding it to make protein to carry out the functions of cells. And we think then that this splicing process is evolutionarily derived from that RNA world type process. And it's now known that the uh, decoding protein synthesis process, the ribosome, is also an RNA catalyzed machine. Again, we think that comes from the RNA world. And that uh, this whole central pathway between DNA splicing to make a message and the decoding in the cytoplasm by the ribosome and tRNA uh, is part of uh, a, a reflection or uh, derived from the earlier points in, in, in life where RNA was the genetic material. 